We're really pleased to have Keith Nosbush here uh, as our speaker. One of the real uh, uh, treats of the GMC is from time to time to have CEOs from our community speak and address uh, their industries and the things that are really happening. You know, uh, I saw a note in preparation for today that say that, you know, we should sort of view the old, pro old proverb as sort of what we're likely to hear today. May we live in really interesting times, and certainly Keith uh, does just that. Much of the literature now describes uh, the notion uh, that uh, the industrial uh, in, uh, entities in our country are in a rapid uh, transition. And Keith has been quoted uh, uh, as saying in the last six months that there probably is as much change going on in his space in automation and manufacturing and that will occur over the next dec decade as maybe has occurred in the last uh, half a century. Uh, one of the wonderful things about uh, having uh, uh, these programs is it gives us an opportunity also uh, to have a group of panelists uh, to give insight into uh, things uh, that are not uh, frequently written about uh, in the press. Uh, Keith started his career, as many of you know, uh, uh, at uh, Rockwell in 1974 uh, as an applications engineer. And obviously, he became CEO in 2004 four and held many important uh, positions on his rise uh, uh, through uh, that company. Uh, uh, Keith is a graduate of the University of, uh, uh, of Wisconsin, undergraduate and an MBA from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Uh, his, uh, he's additionally a director of the Manitowoc Corporation and importantly has uh, his fingerprints on many things that are helpful to this community in terms of business, civic and community organizations. So Keith. Uh, we welcome you and look forward uh, to your presentation here today. Okay. Well, thank you, John, and it's exciting to be here today. Uh, certainly, um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about innovation and the importance of it to uh, Rockwell Automation but also tie that to uh, how we see uh, the future in manufacturing and how innovation is going to play a very key role uh, to that. And then, uh, but I'll first start with, there may be some of you that don't have as much uh, background uh, on Rockwell today, so I'll just have a brief, brief introduction of uh, who we are and uh, what we do. Today, we are, uh, we are a leading global provider of industrial power control and information solutions. Uh, in fact, we are the largest company in the world that is solely focused on industrial automation and information, and it's our only business. This is all we do every day. Our sales in fiscal 2014 were $6.62 billion, and about 50% of our sales are outside the U.S. We report we have two business segments, but quite frankly, we go to market as one business. Both segments have common customers. We have common development processes, and we have a common supply chain with a common sales force as well. In fiscal 2014, our architecture and software segment made up about 43% of our total sales, and our control products and solutions segment uh, made up the remaining 57%. We, today, we have over 22,500 people around the world, and over 60% of those are outside of the U.S. We serve a very wide range of industries, and this goes from automotive and consumer products, consumer packaged goods, to mining and oil and gas. And really, uh, I think what's important and one of the great traits of our company is that we do listen to our customers and respond to their business challenge, and we try to do that with innovative, cost-effective solutions. And I really think this expansion of our served market has been what has been uh, one of the keys to our success and the ability to continue to diversify and continue to remain relevant is a, is a key part of that. This past year, we reached our 111th year of serving customers and we attribute our success over the years to the intense focus that we have on techn technology innovation, a deep domain expertise in all the industries and verticals that we serve, 
And certainly, we do have a culture of integrity and corporate responsibility. So enough background. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about the future and not only where we're going, but where we believe uh, industry is going as well. We have created a vision that we call the Connected Enterprise. The Connected Enterprise is focused on rapid value creation through the tighter integration between industrial assets and the rest of the enterprise value chain. The tighter integration requires secure networks, ease of data collection and management, and more importantly, contextualizing that data to turn it into actionable information. And this information is now shared across the enterprise and out across the value chain from, to suppliers and customers. And we think this results in an enterprise that can be optimized to drive quantified business value. And we believe today we're at the inflection point for the realization of the connected enterprise by our customers. Why is this important? And what are the business drivers for this transition? Well, according to Industry Week, less than 14% of manufacturers have connected their plant floors to the enterprise. So clearly, we have a huge opportunity here. According to Kapersky Lab, 21% of manufacturers reported a loss of IP last year due to a breach in security. So our customers expect us to provide a secure environment. Big data generated from operations can be used for making faster and more importantly, better business decisions and to rapidly drive value. Unscheduled downtime costs manufacturers billions of dollars a year and we think this contextualized data will help manufacturers quickly understand, but more importantly, correct the root causes of downtime. And finally, upgrading aging plant infrastructure and legacy automation systems provide a great opportunity to drive a new level of productivity. The connected enterprise also needs to address the migration of a huge legacy and installed base of automation systems. With these drivers, the Connected enterprise has become a business imperative today. Central to achieving the connected enterprise is the need to converge information technology, which all of us know as IT, and operations technology, or OT. OT is the world of industrial equipment, machines and controllers, sensors, actuators. IT is the world of end-to-end -end business processes, ERP, CRM systems, supply chain management, logistics, HR, processes like that. Historically, these are two different worlds with a different culture, priorities, and base technologies. Critical to the OT side is real-time data that drives control and safety. Real-time data is typically co co collected and acted upon in milliseconds or microseconds. Frankly, reliable and repeatable processes for control safety and security are paramount in this world. Many operations need to run 24-7 safely and securely, and industrial processes cannot tolerate shutdowns for software updates. On the IT side, transactional data and business systems form the backbone with their own priorities on what is mission critical. Transactions may take several seconds or even minutes, and the IT side is much more tolerant of software patches and updates that may sometimes shut down a computer or two. However, however, both IT and OT are critical to the success of, the, of an industrial enterprise, but true convergence between these two worlds remains a challenge. Most approaches so far have been inflexible, expensive, complex, and do not scale very easily. Over the past several years, Rockwell Automation has been working to bridge this gap. We've made tremendous progress in bringing a more robust IP-based network infrastructure to industrial automation with a broad range of jointly developed hardware and software products, solutions, and services that we've jointly developed with our strategic partner, Cisco. As many of you know, Cisco is the leader in IT networks and infrastructure. This flatter, more open approach to industrial networking has delivered a level of performance and flexibility that was simply not achievable with the previous generations of more proprietary industrial technology, and it is the foundation of driving ITOT convergence. 
We believe that connected enterprise is transformational. By making the convergence of IT and OT take place in a more cost-effective and scalable way, leading to even greater productivity and global competitiveness. It is enhanced by modern trends, such as the Internet of Things, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. And as a result, as John mentioned, we believe industrial operations will change more radically in the next 10 years than it has in the last 50. Rockwell Automation is, a, is applying our industrial expertise to help our customers realize the connected enterprise through innovation of not just technology, but of processes and business models. That results in tangible business values in four areas that I've highlighted here. For reducing time to market, we work with customers to design and implement phases of their automation investment, creating flexibility and agility. Really, that's all about can they respond to their customers' needs more quickly. We help our customers reduce the total cost of their automation investment. It includes the upfront investment, ongoing operating costs, and long-term support of their installed base. In the face of increasing global competition, our customers need to continually find ways to optimize operations and improve asset utilization. Our automation and information product solutions and services enable our customers to maximize throughput while minimizing downtime. Since industrial processes touch many aspects of enterprise risk, we help our customers design, operate, and maintain a safe and reliable and secure operating environment. We help them meet regulatory or environmental compliance requirements. And, the, and at the end of the day, we protect their reputations as suppliers of quality products and good stewards of the environment. Everything we do is focused on helping our customers realize tangible business benefits in one or more of the four values I just mentioned. Let me now shift gears and talk a little bit about how contemporary technologies and innovation are going to be required to realize the connected enterprise. Modern technologies are helping us connect smart assets to the rest of the enterprise. The foundation of ever smarter industrial assets coupled through contemporary control and information capabilities via IP-based network in infrastructure is really what's driving this revolution in manufacturing. The IP-based infrastructure is enhanced by the industrial environment delivering real-time information. The data from these smart assets will be processed, aggregated, and analyzed with scalable computing that is delivered at the point of most value, whether that is directly within the controller, on the plant floor, on the edge, or today, what is more popular talked about in the cloud. And then further, we need to make sure that we have contemporary mobility platforms. This brings information visibility, collaboration, and remote expertise into the hands of those who need it the most, those that are on the front line of operations. Individually, each of these technologies can add value to an industrial process, but when integrated together, we can build much more powerful solutions that deliver this transformational business value. The connected enterprise will unleash untapped value within all of these industrial things or smart assets. We understand the value of the connected enterprise because we've realized the benefits in our own operations. We have been on a multi-year journey to connect our global manufacturing footprint to the rest of our enterprise and we've delivered true business value in that, in that exercise. This is what we refer to as integrated control and information and is how we help our customers realize their vision of the connected enterprise. How do we do this? We deliver the connected enterprise through three core platforms. The first one is the integrated architecture. It is the market-leading, multidiscipline control and information offering. It is highly scalable and capable of differentiating high-performance machines for our OEM customers, as well as delivering advanced plant-wide optimization for our end users. 
Complementing the integrated architecture is our world-class intelligent motor control product portfolio. This is from basic motor control to the most advanced in integrated drive systems. And this entire IMC product line is enabled by the integrated architecture, which helps our customers speed integration, enhance performance, and reduce downtime. Our global network of application and technology experts are able to deliver a wide range of consultative design integration and support services and solutions. We complement and extend these three core platforms with our partner network. And this partner network is simply the best in the community today. We have made huge dollar investments, hundreds of millions of dollars in the last couple of years to completely update and extend our core integrated control and information platforms. And quite frankly, we're going to spend hundreds of millions more over the next couple of years to sustain and more importantly, extend our competitive differentiation. We are driving innovation with our three core platforms to deliver integrated control and information. And this is what enables the connected enterprise. Innovation. There are two types of innovation, disruptive and sustaining. Disruptive innovation transforms existing markets and creates new opportunities. Sustaining innovation leads to commoditization over time. The connected enterprise requires disruptive innovation in areas such as real-time data management, information security, and analytics. At Rockwell, we use a stage gate process for product development, and here we have embedded innovation toll gates in the first three stages of this process to drive innovation and more importantly capture intellectual property. This ensures ongoing focus on innovation in all product development activities in our company. As I mentioned the connected enterprise vision is transformational and it will take significant disruptive innovation to realize the full benefits from it. This chart illustrates the major discontinuities in our market and the importance of a strong IP portfolio today. Discontinuities are happening faster now than ever before. In our first 75 years, we saw mostly evolutionary growth of electromechanical products. The first major discontinuity was the application of electronic controls and PLCs for automatic control of electromechanical products. We were at the forefront of driving this innovation. The second major discontinuity from PLCs to integrated architecture was also driven by us. As in each discontinuity, some competitors lost momentum and more importantly market share to us in the transition. Today, we are driving the next major shift with integrated control and information and the connected enterprise. Our growing intellectual property portfolio is evidenced by the number of issued patents to support each one of these major discontinuities. Due to the time it takes to get patents issued, the IP portfolio tends to lag the discontinuity. Discontinuities today are mainly IP driven and require a more robust IP portfolio in the past. And today we're averaging about 200 patents a year in the US. So it is a very important part of our portfolio. Innovation has been the key in our evolution as a company to an intellectual capital business. Today, it is what we know, our domain expertise, more than just what we make. And quite frankly, today, we are both a technology and a software company. Let me wrap up with something that we're, we're very proud of in, in Rockwell Automation. And in our pursuit of excellence, innovation, as I mentioned, and our commitment to doing the right thing have been recognized by a range of organizations. For example, our company was cited as a leading innovator by both Forbes and Thomson Reuters. And for the seventh time, Rockwell Automation was named one of the world's most ethical companies by Ethisphere. In addition, the Council on Better Business Bureaus 
presented Rockwell Automation with the International Torch Award for Marketplace Excellence. Our global commitment to building a more sustainable future was also recognized by our selection to a number of well-respected indices, including the Just Means Global 1000, the Top 10 Newsweek Green Rankings, Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and a number of others. We're very proud of our legacy of corporate responsibility, both in the community and around the world. So that is our story, a story that, um, that has been ongoing for over 100 years now. At the core of it is innovation and, quite frankly, uh, the talented people that we have in our company that drives that innovation. So with that, let me turn it open to Julia and the next phase. Well, thank you very much, Keith. It's fascinating to hear about your integrated smart enterprise system. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, and I'd like now to introduce three panelists who I'm sure are going to have some great insightful questions for you. I don't, don't know if they're all softball or hardball, but we're about to find out. So uh, Don Davis became Chairman Emeritus of Rockwell Automation in February 2006 when he retired as the company's chairman and CEO. He served as Rockwell's international chairman and CEO from 97 until 99 when he became chairman and CEO of Rockwell Automation. After graduating from Texas A&M with a BSME and an MBA, Don joined Alan Bradley as an engineering, uh, as an engineering sales engineer, it, and he held a series of key corporate and business uh, roles until the, within the company until he was named president in 1989. He's a member of the board of directors of Illinois Tool Works, and he's active in many companies and organizations. He's an active supporter of education and community programs, and among other awards, received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from Texas A&M in 2010. Dr. Herman Vietz has served as the fourth president of the Milwaukee School of Engineering since 1991, and he retires this month after a transformative era at the school where he emphasized the pragmatic side of, it, of education, and particularly connecting up your graduates to our business community. Dr. Vietz was a visiting scientist, aerospace engineer, and research group leader for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Aerospace Research Laboratories, a lecturer of the Von Karman Institute in Brussels, and a research associate at the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn. He received his bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and a master's and PhD in astronautics from Polytechnic University. So it's no surprise that you took MSOE to the heights that you've taken it, right? With an aerospace background. Uh, Mary Lou Young is the president and CEO of the newly formed United Way of Greater Milwaukee in Waukesha Co County. Since becoming president and CEO in 2009, she transformed the organization into a driving force for social change. She has a national reputation as a thought leader, and she's received several awards, including the Milwaukee Business Journal's Women of Influence Award in 2011, the Key Award from the Boys and Girls Club in 2014, and the Sacagawea Award in 2015. Mary Lou attended Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, and has contrib contributed to United Way since her first job in high school. So welcome Don, Herman, and Mary Lou. Please come to stage. Well, I guess I'll be the moderator here, Don, so why don't we, why don't we uh, let you get it, why don't we let you get it started and uh, the tough questions we pass down the line and the easy ones come to me. Well, the first thing I would like to do is to publicly acknowledge what a great job Keith Nisbush and his management team have done since in the last 10 years uh, since I left and they really have done a wonderful job and I even understood a little bit about what you talked about. <laughs> well, well you, you, you know as, as everything Don it's about timing and uh, I think you did the first pyramid integrator uh, back a little longer so yeah, you, well. you, have a, you have a great history here. It didn't enjoy the success that this is though. <laughs> But it was on the right path. Absolutely. Uh, Keith, the first question that I'd like for you to address with uh, the people here today is what are the two or three issues, strategic issues, that a CEO is going to have to deal with in order to continue the success that we've had? Uh, 
I, I don't think it'll just be um, in, in, in Rockwell, but I think today, uh, probably first and foremost, it's about talent and talent management. And we need to do that on a global basis now because that's where the talent is, that's where our customers are. But having the best and the brightest is the only way you can create an innovative, a intellectual capital business. And so talent management in all forms, all dimensions, is probably one of the most important processes that, that a CEO needs to make sure is working uh, in their organization. And then second, it goes back to the comment John and I made, and that is about what's going to happen over the next decade compared to the last 50 years. And that is CEOs have to be leaders of change. And uh, change management and helping an organization be able to take change, embrace it, and see the opportunities that it brings as opposed to the negative side, which means all of us have to change. And quite frankly, uh, most people don't want to change and would prefer not to. But you have to make sure that as a management and as a leadership team, and that starts at the top, uh, that you're able to help them understand why it's going to be better when you come through the change. And how can you do that in a way uh, that, um, that not only helps customers, but is good for the employees and also in the communities that we, that we represent. So I would say talent management and change management are, are two very, very critical uh, dimensions, Don. Right. Sure, Keith. Um, first of all, I want to echo what Don said and thank you for your leadership. Don and I are feeling pretty, I'm sorry. Oh, Don and I are feeling pretty secure right now with our pension plans, so thank you. <laughs> you know, I know the company has a strong emphasis on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, and globally you're invested in the FIRST program, which stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. Can you talk about why the company is invested in this program and how it excites and energizes kids around the globe? Well, um, the fact of the matter is it's good for our business. And uh, quite frankly, that's, what we, that's why we invest in it. Uh, we believe very strongly, it goes back to my first comment, uh, talent, talent management. STEM education is very important to our business. Quite frankly, uh, STEM is important to almost any dimension today, not just technology companies, but the need to be able to have some analytical thinking, some critical problem, sil uh, problem solving skills. These are in demand no matter what role uh, people are in. But we started working uh, in Milwaukee and, um, and actually we started uh, giving uh, college uh, scholarships to uh, the underrepresented class of, uh, of, of society. And we found out that um, we were way too late in the process. What do I mean by that? Uh, by the time kids are going to college, it's too late to have a STEM education and a STEM background. And so we moved to the high schools and we started FIRST Robotics. We then found out that's too late. And we moved to the middle school and we found out that's too late. And then we went to grade school. So today we support FIRST with Junior Lego League, Lego League, and FIRST Robotics. And really it's about what we've learned is how do you create a pipeline, a pipeline of talent. And you need to do that very young. And the amazing thing is if you start young enough, um, it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic background is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. Um, and it doesn't matter what your ethnicity uh, is. Everybody likes to play with Legos. Everyone likes to have fun. If you can make this fun, um, it's, uh, it, it doesn't seem quite as uh, tough as, quite frankly, college courses in engineering turned out to be. Uh, so we, we, we created FIRST was a great, we didn't create it, I'm sorry. We found FIRST was a great vehicle. We use that as our after school program. In school, we have, uh, we've jumped on the Kern Foundation, who started in Wisconsin anyways, um, 
the Project Lead the Way. And that is the in-school program. We combine that with the after-school program of FIRST Robotics. We sponsored over 160 teams this last year. Uh, we run it in over 50 countries of the world. Uh, we have hundreds of mentors and volunteers that support uh, these programs. And really, it's about creating a pipeline of hopefully talent that either we can hire or, more importantly, that are able to join either customers or society to create a better life for, for everyone, including their communities. So we're very strong believers in STEM, uh, and it certainly has been at the forefront using the, the programs of FIRST Robotics and uh, Project Lead the Way. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Keith, as you've already well demonstrated, uh, you have a high level of modesty. And I'm going to pierce some of that a little bit here. Um, I don't believe that uh, because of your modesty, I believe that many of the people in this room don't know that besides taking engineering in college, that you also were on the Madison football team, UW-Madison football team. And something I didn't know until very recently, that you were captain of the team. Uh, with that, I'd like to ask you, uh, how do you combine that? And for one thing, and it's a big smile, I see that already. But the, the other one is, what does that do in terms of preparation to uh, make you as effective and uh, successful as you've been? Well, you learn to be modest when you're not very good, so. <laughs> <laughs> if we were having the season they have now, I'd probably talk a little more about it. <laughs> but anyways, I, you know, I, I've always been a, a strong believer in, uh, in athletics and, and sports uh, from the standpoint of the lessons it does teach. Uh, in, in our business, uh, it's not about individuals. It's about uh, what can the team accomplish, and certainly even more so today than when I even started in, in the business. There's no one single function that can make it all happen. Everything is about collaboration, and, and you have to work cross-disciplines, cross-culturally, and I think athletics and, and team sports are, are a great way to learn how to do that. In addition to just the discipline, the focus, the time management, uh, and when you play sports, you never get used to losing. But you do get up and get back on the, in, the, in the game uh, and play the next game. And you, learned, you learn life lessons about, uh, about losing and getting better every day. And I think that's what business is all about. Uh, I like to say, Don, we win all of the, uh, all of the customers that we, uh, that we go after, but, but we don't. Sorry. Uh, you tried to teach us how to do better there, but, uh, but every once in a while we lose one of those orders and, uh, and that keeps us going. How do we get better? It's about continuous improvement. And you're only as good as your weakest, um, as, as your weakest uh, performer. And certainly that's something that is very relevant from, from the sports background. Uh, <clears throat> Keith, I have a real softball question for you here, which you partially answered. Uh, but, as you know, and I think most people in this room know, Rockwell Automation has done a great job of changing uh, over the years as uh, industry needs and so forth have changed. What must be done to continue that prosperity? Well, I, I did comment a little bit on about that, Don, but I, but I think that there's a, there's a popular term, not term necessarily, but it's popular now to talk about disruption. And I don't think we talked about that when, when, when we started the process of disrupting ourselves. But, but you have to be willing to disrupt yourself, or others will. And obviously, you now have seen that play out in spades with the uh, digital technologies and how industries and certainly companies are being disrupted on a regular basis. And basically, if you're not looking at ways that you can change, which goes back to the change management, and how you can disrupt yourself, others will. And I think at the end of the day, that, that really now says 
how do you remain paranoid? And how do you continue to not be complacent? Quite frankly, that was something that you, know, you, you taught us that that's probably the worst, uh, the worst environment you can be in is when you're complacent. Um, because once you're complacent, you now started the downturn. And uh, depending on how far you go down, you may not recover. So we remain paranoid. We don't want to become complacent. And really to do that, we have to work in all the dimensions of, of innovation, whether that be technical innovation, which is what's most, uh, I would say, most recognizable by everyone. But there's also the, the innovation around business processes, which have to change, and business models, with, which have to change. So we work really hard on all of those. But it's, it's a challenge to remain a prosperous company today. And for us, it's so important because as a technology company, you have to continue to find ways to be able to invest in the next wave of technology. And you can't do that if you're not prosperous. And prosperous here is very simple. It means making money. If you're not making money, you aren't going to have the resources to reinvest back in the business. And so we work really hard at uh, being able to invest in good times and bad. But more importantly, it's about never becoming complacent or arrogant, which is the other dimension of it. And for prosperous companies, it may be easy to become arrogant, but I know it's very hard to change. And uh, that's why it goes back to change management as one of the most important things that a CEO and a leadership team has to be able to do. There's a lot of focus today on, in the nonprofit world on community-wide efforts, similar to what United Way has done in teen pregnancy prevention, and also on merging nonprofits for a stronger ROI. What do you think about the recent merger that United Way did with Waukesha County, and how does it support uh, this community and your, your employee base? Well, I think Mary Lou, you know me well enough that, uh, that uh, Collaboration is, uh, is, is pretty fundamental, but more importantly, I mean, just congratulations to you personally, as well as your board, for making that happen. I think it was long overdue. We believe that um, with our philanthropy, we're looking for outcomes, uh, quite frankly. And it's not just where can we, where can we, uh, where can we put money. There's lots of opportunities for us. Um, the door is always being knocked on. As, all of the CEOs in this room know. Uh, and there's lots of opportunities to uh, invest in the community. And certainly, we're looking for where there's good leadership, there is a good ROI, and they've, been, and they've demonstrated success and outcomes. And I think the United Way has done that. It is much broader today. Our employee base is, is very dis, dis, dispersed. It's not just the city of Milwaukee. It's just not the county of Milwaukee. And it allows us to have a much better uh, footprint to talk to our employees about, about it, the ability to return the funds uh, to their communities and to where they live, not just where they work. So uh, we, see, we saw it as a, as a great opportunity uh, from, from that. But also it's about how do you reduce infrastructure, which doesn't add value in any of these, uh, any of these uh, uh, nonprofit organizations. So, the ability to leverage, the ability to collaborate, the ability to have uh, wide, community-wide outcomes, as you've demonstrated with teen pregnancy. I mean, the outcome there is incredible. And that's because it wasn't driven by any one organization, any one function. You were able to bring lots of people to the table and create what, what's over, what, 56, 50%, over 50% reduction in an area that people said was going the other way um, just a couple of years ago. So I think the ability to bring different constituents together to have a bigger footprint, a bigger impact than any one organization on its own can have, that's what I think we have to look for uh, because uh, there's fewer dollars and greater need uh, than ever before. So keep, United Way just needs to keep doing that and, and demonstrating the outcomes. Keith, you've been uh, uh, a leader in the national effort to uh, support manufacturing companies. 
and I wonder if you would give us a little insight into some of the more up-to-date challenges that you see for particularly for manufacturing in the United States? Well, number one is image. There's really not a great image of manufacturing in the United States. It's been talked down for such a long period of time uh, that quite frankly, um, you know, 20 years ago, we were gonna become a service economy um, and it, manufacturing didn't matter. Well, I think over those 20 years, we've seen what the, what the outcome of that is. And in fact, Recently now, we're starting to have the discussion and, more importantly, the conversation about the importance of manufacturing and the fact that it is the only area that, uh, that creates value. You know, manufacturing, mining, and farming. Not much else creates value. Uh, a lot of people move it around and redistribute it, but not many create it. The other dimension is manufacturing has the greatest multiplier on building economies and multiplication factor on a dollar in manufacturing is over 1.4 in the overall economy. So we see that as um, manufacturing as fundamental uh, to the future. Uh, we, we think it's the only way uh, that we'll be able to have a better life for the next generation and it's something that, that we're very focused on. And I think we're gonna see a wave of retirements in the next decade. And quite frankly, uh, knowledge transfer um, and helping manufacturers make that transition. But it's really about having manufacturing seen as a positive. When you go into a manufacturing plant today, it is high tech. It is as high tech as anything that exists. Uh, it's just that you know, it, it's not Google, it's not Facebook, uh, and it's not, I would say, the other uh, dimensions that you see. But if you go into a manufacturing facility today, you need competent people and you need professionals, professionals to run it and professionals to uh, support it as, uh, as providers of services to it. So we see building that capability, building um, that positive image of manufacturing is the most important area for us to, uh, to work on and then be able to deal with the transition of all of this knowledge that's going to be leaving. And quite frankly, I, I heard this, um, I heard this um, uh, factoid, and that is in a decade, over 70% of the workforce is going to be millennials. So uh, we, better, we better be ready in lots of dimensions, and I'll let you take it from there. So I, I think that's the signal that we're done. No, 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 actually, that, that was absolutely terrific. And, uh, we have time for about, uh, about two or three questions uh, for Keith. So you, uh, there's a microphone here, but first question, Chuck. So Keith, you mentioned that 60% of your employees are outside of the United States. You mentioned that 60% of your employees are outside of the United States. And in this era right now, at least, of um, major um, mergers and acquisitions and the like, uh, how, do you, how do you protect a company like, how, does, how do you help Milwaukee protect a company like Rockwell uh, from, from being uh, acquired given the fact that you have such an amazing technology platform? Well, uh, as you know, Chuck, we're a, publicly, we're a publicly traded company, so there's not much I can do to stop something uh, if someone really wants to do it. Uh, but I, I would say there's certainly things that I believe can help us stay independent. Uh, one, quite frankly, would be uh, a competitive uh, tax structure in the U.S. Uh, and not because we don't want to pay taxes, but because foreign companies can acquire us on the delta in the tax and not have it be a premium. And so any mid-sized U.S. company is at risk of being taken over uh, if we don't get this uh, solved because the delta and the differential is so great uh, that, that, that that is not competitive. The education system, I said we need the best and the brightest. We still do most of our core technology development in the U.S. Uh, we, need to, um, we need to have a stronger, uh, a stronger education system. And, and not just college, because as I mentioned, you need the feeder pool uh, 
uh, to be able to have great colleges. And, and there's other countries that, are, that recognize that the last bastion of U.S. differentiation, uh, quite frankly, is, is uh, postgraduate, graduate, and undergraduate college uh, institutions that we have. So we need to keep that uh, strong and continue to have that be a, a differentiator. So, but it's really, um, um, you know, as a, as a public company, it's, um, it's uh, what the shareholders are willing to, willing to vote for. And our goal is how do we keep the share price high and dissuade uh, anyone that's uh, interested by performing. And at the end of the day, it's us performing, plain and simple. And uh, the better we do with that, uh, the less we have to worry about some of these other things I talked about. And, uh, so we'll focus on what we can control, and um, that's, uh, that's the way to do it. George? Many years ago, you moved uh, from California to Milwaukee. What if Many years ago, you moved from California to Milwaukee. What have been the long-term effects of that move, and how has it affected employee hiring? Well, we got the guy right here that made the move, so um, I was sitting there, what are you doing that for, Don? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I, you know, we have, uh, to the comment I made earlier, we have people all around the world. So, so we're able to uh, hire people. In Milwaukee, we're able to hire people in uh, Cleveland, but we have... Uh, we have development uh, that goes on in, uh, in every region today. And the talent that we need uh, has to be, has to be uh, global in nature because our customers are, and we need to serve them locally. So uh, I, have been, uh, I, I believe uh, uh, that we're able to attract uh, the people that we uh, need in the different geographies that we're located. And I think the move was mainly uh, because, uh, because of the the change of Rockwell International to where the center of Rockwell was the Midwest. And it didn't make any sense to have a corporate headquarters on the West Coast as we moved out of the aerospace industry. We had a great franchise, Rockwell Collins. We had a great franchise, Rockwell Automation. That was the core of the company. And I think Don had shorter airline flights if he was in Milwaukee and uh, I was next door and, Do and, Doug and uh, our friend Clay Jones was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So we were a Midwest centric uh, enterprise at that point and it just made sense as well, economic sense as well as uh, any others to, uh, to have it be closer and more tightly together. One, one last one, and uh, I have to say I was shocked by that statistic you shared around 14% or fewer um, have connectivity between the plant floor and the ERP or the enterprise system. So in my world, in biopharma, a lot of manufacturing is done on a contract basis, and I have to assume Rockwell's on the right side of that 14%, right? So but yes. do, you, do you guys have a, a lot of contract manufacturing relationships that are embedded within your workflow, and how do you connect them? We don't have a lot of uh, contract manufacturing. Uh, we do most of the manufacturing ourselves, but we, uh, but we are able to have integrated supply chains and planning systems. And, and I would say that that is the way we do it. We do have some outsourced uh, printed circuit board manufacturing simply because we don't need to do all of them to have competence. But we want to be able to deal with the fluctuations in our demand and not have us have to absorb it as well as having the fixed cost uh, because we're a cyclical industry. So we try to have less uh, impact internally and cyclicality, yet we want to be able to have, I'll just call it digital connectivity between the supply chain. And we do that with all of our suppliers now, so it doesn't matter if, if we're buying a product or a component. It's still, uh, the system still plan not still plans, but the system's interactions are the same. We're ordering part numbers. In some cases, it's a, 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 a finished product. In others, it's a raw material. So, so it's, it's the connectivity that ultimately is, is what matters. And what type of planning systems do you have? And more importantly, do you have end-to-end -end supply chain visibility? That's 
the fundamental key, quite frankly. That's how we've been able to dramatically reduce our lead times, which is great for customers. Also shrink our inventory uh, that we need. And ultimately, when we go to uh, multi-echelon planning, we'll be able to plan uh, our, with our suppliers, our plants, and our, our um, uh, distributors and be able to do that as one, as opposed to today we have three silos. So we still have, a, we still have ways to go, which is important so we can drive productivity and take cost out. But it is about really integrating and doing it on, a, on, on having supply, total supply chain visibility and being able to understand uh, what's happening, starting with what's the customer buying and why are we not making what they're buying as opposed to forecast? Because the only thing I know, and that is we're terrible forecasters, uh, whether it be next quarter uh, or, uh, or our supply chain and what the customers are really buying. So, and that's what we work with our customers on too. We have shrunk their supply chains. We have allowed them to take distribution out because they can now build to customer order, not build to forecast. And I think that's how we're going to take more cost out, drive cash flow uh, for our customers. And I know it's been working for Rockwell in, in, in both of those dimensions. We've taken, we've reduced our lead times uh, by, by about a third uh, because of what we can now do. And we've taken, uh, we've reduced our uh, days on hand inventory of, uh, by 50% since we, uh, since we introduced uh, this, this concept internally. Now that was a combination of things, starting with a common uh, enterprise uh, ERP system, but the connection to the plant floor is what allows us to, to take it real time. Keith, we really want to thank you for coming and sharing with you. That was absolutely terrific. Don and Mary Lou and Herman, thank you uh, for the questions. Certainly we, we hope everybody has a wonderful uh, a wonderful summer. Uh, your remarks about talent, you know, sort of, it's the same thing that you're over and over again. You know, I always say anybody can identify a superstar. We have an opportunity to create talent in our community, so I would encourage all of you to sort of go back to your companies and just, you know, make a 30-second check mark relative to the talent we're trying to recruit uh, in this community. Uh, the check mark I made today, Keith, was that uh, now when I fill out my football pool, mm -hmm. I now know a guy who understands analytics and football. So I'll see you again. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you.